Today in the workshop, we're testing a PlayStation 3 controller with an ESP32. You'll see how we can make the controller with the ESP32 and use it to control LEDs, motors, and a lot more. I'll also show you my robot car development base. We're not playing games today, so welcome to the workshop. Well, hello and welcome to the workshop and today in the workshop we're going to be playing with one of these and yes this is a video game controller it's a clone of the controller for the sony playstation 3 but no we aren't going to be playing video games in fact i don't even know how to play video games as i've never played any and i haven't owned one of these until about four days ago but i'm very glad i bought it because you can also use this controller with an esp32 and pretty well control anything that you can connect to an ESP32, which is a lot of different things. And today that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to use this amazing library with the ESP32 and made it with this game controller and see what it is that we can control. Now, as I said, I don't play video games. I can't tell you how to blast aliens or build empires with this. But one thing I can tell you is how the Sony PlayStation 3 controller works. So let's go and take a look at that before we get started. The Sony PlayStation 3 or PS3 was originally released in 2006. The PS3 controller can also be referred to as a 6-axis or DualShock 3 controller. This is an updated version of the previous controller which was referred to as a DualShock 2 and one of the updates includes a number of motion sensors. There have been many different controller updates since its original 2006 release. The PS3 controller and console use Bluetooth for communications. The protocol being used is Bluetooth HID or Human Interface Device Protocol. This is the same protocol used for Bluetooth mice and keyboards. To connect the controller to a console requires a pairing operation in which both the controller and the console exchange their individual MAC addresses. The PS3 controller stores the console MAC address in a non-volatile RAM. The controller sends both joystick and button state data to the console, and it can also receive data for its internal rumble motors from the console. Now here's the layout of a typical PS3 controller. On the far left side, you can see four buttons which are mechanically connected together. These are known as the directional pad or D-pad, and within the PlayStation, they're often used to navigate menus and make selections. At the bottom of the controller, you will find two joysticks, a left joystick and a right joystick. These send both X and Y coordinates to the console. On the right side of the controller, we have four buttons, a cross, a circle, a square, and a triangle. These buttons are generally used within video games, but of course for our purposes we can use them for pretty well anything. In the center of the console there is a start button and a select button, both which are normally used within games, but again we can use them for our purposes, and the PS or PlayStation button, which can be used as a power button and also to select menus. Looking at the front of the controller, we can see two buttons on each side. On the right side are the right shoulder and right trigger buttons, and the left side the left shoulder and left trigger. Remember we're looking at the front of the controller, and that's why left and right are reversed. There are four LEDs on the front of the controller, and their status can be set by the console. Finally, the controller has a mini USB jack. This jack is used for two purposes. It can be used to recharge the internal battery, and it can also be used to connect the controller directly to a console or to a personal computer. In addition to the previously described features, the PlayStation 3 controller also contains two motors, one in each handle, and this will rumble the controller as a form of tactical feedback. Internally, the PS3 controller has a 3-axis accelerometer to get an X, Y, and Z position. It also contains a gyroscope to detect rotational movement. Finally, the PlayStation 3 controller has an internal rechargeable battery. So let's take a look at a couple of PS3 controllers, and then we'll see how we can use these as control devices for an ESP32. 
And here are the two PS3 style controllers that I picked up. Uh, now, of course, showing these off to most of you is probably pretty silly because I'm sure you probably have a whole home full of these things. But as I said earlier, I'm not a gamer, so these are very new to me. I just got them a few days ago. I bought them individually and I paid uh, 16 Canadian dollars for each one of these. That's about 12 US dollars. I actually could have bought them as a pair for 25 Canadian which is in the neighborhood of 20 US dollars and that to me is the most amazing thing about these is the value of these like considering what you get for like 10 or 12 US dollars it's absolutely unbelievable of course these are very inexpensive controllers you can get higher quality ones but for most of the purposes we're going to use these will work just perfectly and as you can see they've got a couple of joysticks on them uh, some buttons over here there's a whole button pad over here and there are some buttons on this side as well too. Now over here you'll see a few LEDs. Uh, this is the um, mini USB port. I actually like mini USB better than micro USB to be perfectly honest, at least for power purposes. I think it's more rugged. And this is what you will use to charge it. And it's also what we're going to use in order to get the MAC address that they have buried inside here. That's the MAC address of the console. Now inside here, there is more than meets the eye. There's actually an accelerometer inside here so as you move this around uh, you can send readings out to the console and in each of the handles they've got a little motor and the motor is there for vibrating it so the console can send back a signal to vibrate the controller and give you some feedback so again for the kind of money that these things go for they're an incredible value and so today we're going to see how we can use these with an ESP32. Now, before you can begin your experiments with your ESP32 and the PS3 controller, you're going to need to know what MAC address is embedded inside the controller. Now, I want to be clear about this. This is not the controller's MAC address. This is the MAC address of the console. And that MAC address is held within non-volatile memory inside your controller. Now, you can probably get the MAC address of your console from the console itself. However, there is another way of retrieving it, and it is a tool called the 6-Access Pair Tool, which you see over here. Now, this is an excellent tool, and it works very well, but it does have one serious drawback, and that is it is only available for Microsoft Windows. So if you're using Linux or Mac, you're going to have to find the Windows machine in order to use this. Now, I've plugged in my controller, and you'll notice that I seem to have a MAC address of all zeros, which might initially seem to be strange, but it's not. Remember, I don't own one of these consoles, and so I just bought a controller, and when you buy a new controller, it usually does have a MAC address of all zeros, and that's because it's a broadcast address, and so it will be able to connect to the console and then obtain the correct MAC address. However, if you do have a controller that was used with a console, you will have a different address up over here, and this is the address that you wish to record in order to use with our experiments. Now, you can also also change the address and if you wish you can type a new MAC address into here hit update and it will write it to the non-volatile memory so this is a very easy way of changing the MAC address especially if you want to do these experiments and you still have a working PS3 console and you don't want interference between the two of them but at any rate the six axis pair tool is a simple way of getting the embedded MAC address from your PS3 controller so as we've seen, the Sony PlayStation 3 controllers just use Bluetooth to communicate with the console. And of course, since the ESP32 uses Bluetooth, we should be able to communicate with the ESP32. Now, we could take the PlayStation 3 controller, set up a communication link to the ESP32, and try to decode all of its signals. But that would be a lot of work, and we really don't need to do it thanks to a fellow named Jeffrey Van Pernis. Jeffrey has created a library for the ESP32. 32 specifically for working with the PS3 controller and it is absolutely fantastic. So let's go and install Jeffrey's library and then run a few of the example sketches that will show you just how easy it is to make an ESP32 talk to a Sony PS3 controller. 
Now here's the ESP32 PS3 library up on GitHub, and you can head over there to learn a bit more about this library. Uh, they've got a bit of documentation down over here, including some bits about pairing the controller, getting the MAC address, some of the stuff we've already covered, and they also show you how to get started with the library with both the Arduino IDE and the ESP32 IDF environment. Now you can install the library over here by downloading the zip but if you're using the Arduino IDE you could do it directly within the IDE and so if you go into your libraries over here and type in ESP32 PS3 as I have over here you will get the library now I've already got mine installed of course but you can hit the install button to install it yourself and once you've installed the library it does come with a number of code examples some of which we are going to run and they demonstrate how we can use this excellent PS3 controller library library. Now the library includes a number of example sketches and if you're only going to run one I would suggest running this one the PS3 demo sketch because this pretty well shows almost every function of the library. Now we start by including the library itself and when you include the library it creates an object itself called PS3 and so you just use that within your sketch. The only other thing they define up here is a couple of integers player has to do with the player LEDs on the controller and battery is the level of the battery in the controller. Now the first uh, function that they define is called notify and notify is actually a callback function. It'll be be defined as that in the setup and this callback function is executed every single time that data is received in the controller and what they've done in notify is just gone and checked every single button every single control and displayed its status on the screen if it is being manipulated so for example over here is the cross button and we're looking at an event for the button down and if it happens we'll print started pressing the cross button and here's the button up event which is release the cross button and they go through the same thing for the square and the triangle button, etc., etc. Then they go through what are called the D-pad buttons, which are the ones which have the arrows for up, down, left, and right. And they do the same thing. Uh, the shoulder buttons, the same thing, and the trigger buttons. Uh, now we go to the digital stick events, and we do the same thing for those. Um, and then even the buttons for start and stop, etc., they all get treated here. So every single button on the controller has its status displayed. If you activate it, it'll trigger in here. Now we go to the two analog joysticks, and there are a left joystick and a right one. Here's the left one, so here's left X and left Y, and here's right X and right Y, and we're going to print the values of them so we can get the joystick values over here. And the D-pads also have analog events as well, and so we print those ones as well whenever the analog value of the change. And so this basically goes through every single possible event and then goes through battery events and the battery event is just simply the state of the battery whether it's charging full low even dying or if it's in shutdown mode now there's another one called on connect and this is just executed every time that the controller has been connected and in this case all they're doing is printing connected but you could execute some other functions in your code if you wanted to now we get to the setup and in the setup we're setting up a serial monitor then we attach notify and that attaches as it says here passed as a callback so this attaches the callback function so whatever you name your callback function in this case it was called notify you attach it here you also attach one for the on connect event and we attack the one we just saw that just prints connected and then we do ps3 begin and over here is the only area that you're going to need to modify in the sketch because this is the mac address for your controller so you will have determined the mac address already fill that in over here instead of this address and you're good to go and in the loop we just look to make sure we're connected if we're not connected uh, we return otherwise we set the LED is the player mode and we set our LEDs up and then we keep changing players so the LEDs are going to cycle back and forth on the controller you'll notice that while it's going and we also take a look at a couple of events where you're pressing more than one button and we print those out as well now remember we'll get a 
call back every time data is received when we uh, make an action on the controller and that will also print on the screen. So all the action will be on our serial monitor. So it's a pretty comprehensive sketch but by looking at it you can see how you can use this library for your own applications. So let's load it up to my ESP32 and test it out. All right, so we're running the demo. You can see my serial monitor. It's just cycling the LEDs on the controller. And uh, I'm gonna move the joystick and see what happens. And my right joystick, it's showing the values for the X and the Y position on the joystick. If you look on the serial monitor, I can get the same thing for the left joystick. And of course, let's push a few buttons. Pressing and releasing the button shows, and I can go through the various buttons. And the serial monitor displays what it is I'm pressing and releasing. Same with the buttons on this side over here. And you'll notice that you even get some values for the buttons, and that basically seems to depend on how hard you press them. So you get analog values for a lot of the buttons too. We'll try some of the buttons on the front and you get values for those too. And so you could register how hard someone is pressing the button or how fast they are. And of course you can see the application there in video games, but in your own controller applications that might come in useful as well. And uh, so it does seem to work. It seems to respond to pretty well every event on my controller. And of course we can take this code and rewrite it for our own purposes. Now the next demonstration is the PS3 accelerometer demonstration and you can probably guess from its name what it does. It basically reads back all of the different values from the accelerometer. So that's the axis for the X, Y, and Z. It can also display gyroscope data if you uncomment this line over here. So you can get a fourth piece of data out of this as well. And it's a very simple sketch. It just includes the library. Notify once again is the callback function. It's being attached over here and PS3 begin of course you're going to have to replace this with the Mac address of your controller and there's nothing in the loop now I've already uploaded this to my ESP32 and it's running in the background now so we'll put on the serial monitor and you'll see that I'm getting three different readings which are pretty well the same and that's because my controller is stationary and if I move the controller you can see the readings change and if I lift it up and move it around I can get a number of different readings right now. So this is absolutely great. If you have something that you want to control and you want to actually provide the ability to control it by moving around the controller, you could certainly use this function. So again, this illustrates just how easy it is to code using this library. Now the next demonstration is a little bit different in that it's not taking data back from the controller, but it's the only one that actually sends data to the controller. And this is the PS3 rumble demonstration. And it activates the two built-in motors in the controller to basically rumble it. And this is a form of tactical feedback. And so we start off again by including the PS3 controller library. And then we go right into our setup. We set up our serial monitor, which in this particular case doesn't really do anything. Uh, the PS3 begin, of course, you're going to replace this with your own MAC address, and then we can just print out ready, which I think is the only thing that prints on the serial monitor in this sketch. Then we go into our loop, we check to see if we're connected to the PS3 controller, and if we are, we basically send it a bunch of different rumbles. We send it uh, a rumble for full intensity for one second, and that's the full intensity over here, and here's the period of time, the one second, we'll delay for two seconds, then we'll set it to full intensity indefinitely, so we don't provide it the second parameter, and over here we'll turn off the rumble by setting its intensity down to zero. Note the use of the decimal number over here to set the intensity. And so that's basically all there is to the sketch. I'm going to load it up to my ESP32, and we'll see if we can get my controller rumbling. And here's our rumble demonstration. Now it's a little bit hard to film because you really need to be able to feel this. But if you watch the controller, you can see that it's actually moving right now. It's moving across the desk as it rumbles. And you could probably hear the rumble as well, at least if I shut up for a moment, you can. Mm -hmm. 
And so that seems to work pretty well, and it's a really interesting feedback mechanism that you can use in your design with a PS3 remote control and an ESP32. Now the example sketches that were provided with the ESP32 PS3 library are excellent and they will give you enough information so that you can write your own code for building your own interfaces for the PS3 controller. However, the examples only use a serial monitor and in the real world you probably want to use things like LEDs and displays and motors etc. And so that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to do it in a fun fashion. I want to show you something that I use in my workshop whenever I'm working on robotics projects. When I work on robotics projects, I'm always putting together one of those little two-wheel robot bases. I'm always having to figure out a power supply for the motors and for the project itself. I'm always having to wire up an H-bridge driver. And so what I did was created what I call my robot experimenters base, where I took one of those two-wheel chassis, put a solderless breadboard onto it, put a power supply onto it, put a motor driver onto it and I can use this for prototyping robot designs and we're going to use this today with the ESP32 and the PS3 controller. I'm going to put an ESP32 onto the breadboard and we're going to start adding components one by one to the ESP32 and control them with the PS3 controller. By the time we're finished we will we'll have built a remote controlled robot car using our PS3 controller and an ESP32. So let me show you my robot experimenters base and then we'll get started controlling components with the PS3 controller and the amazing ESP32 library. Now here's the device that I'm calling my robot car experimenters base and it's basically one of those two wheel robot car kits upon which I've mounted a power supply unit, a solderless breadboard and a few other things. Let me give you a quick rundown of what's here. Most of the action is on the back here of course and this is a power supply that actually gives out three different voltages. As you can see it's powered by two 18650 batteries and the raw battery voltage goes over to the motor driver that I've got here. So this is what I I'm using to drive the motors with. I also have a regulator here, a buck converter, and this regulates it down to 5 volts at a fairly decent current capability. And back over here, if you can see it, there's, uh, let me tilt it for you, there's a three pin regulator here, a low dropout three pin regulator, and it makes six volts. And that six volts is for servo motors. Now you'll notice I have a servo on the front over here I can use for experimenting. Also over here, the servo connector runs to here, and there are, if you can see them, three more connectors for it. And I've got the power and ground permanently wired to there, and then the uh, data pin from the servo goes to this female connector, if you can see it here, and that lets me get at it um, with a jumper wire, and I've already got my servos powered, and it's very easy to work with. Um, I've got down over here a logic level converter, and its inputs and outputs go to these female uh, connectors here so I can convert 3.3 to 5 volts it's just a two channel unit uh, these are the connections for the motor driver itself over here in the middle where you see I have these wires jumper this is for using sensors I've got both um, male and females and they're wired together so that I can plug a sensor into here and then use the female connectors to get at their wires so I can jumper them to the solderless breadboard there's a couple of connectors here I can get the 5 volts out the 5 volt out also comes over to here so this rail on my solderless breadboard is 5 volts and ground. I've also placed a USB connector here so if I have a device let's say like a Raspberry Pi I can just plug the USB into here to power it up. Now of course the main feature you can see here is a couple of small solderless breadboards. I've also got some tiny breadboards over here we can use for mounting sensors. There's a few LEDs over here. There's two over here here and the LEDs have little connectors on them as well female ones there's three wires connecting the LED because you can connect to the LED directly 
or you can get it so that the anode goes through this 220 ohm dropping resistor and since that's such a common requirement that is put them there so I don't have to wire it again these connectors over here this is a strip board and they're all wired in uh, parallel they're just male and female connectors and again this lets me take things like sensors which would have maybe a wire that has a female connector plug it into the male connector and then be able to get at the wires with the female connectors over here and because I have multiple ones I can actually make more than one connection to a wire so this is just handy for sensors and it saves up area on the solderless breadboard now if I flip this over you'll see that I have the speed sensors over here mounted now I'm not using the speed sensors in this particular stuff that we're doing today but of course for some designs that comes in useful and oh yes underneath here you'll see this beautiful wooden base made of my favorite construction material which is scrap wood and this just lets me hold this up while I'm working on it so that when the motors move it doesn't go running all over the place and I just find this a very useful thing to have whenever I'm building a robot car because I always need a motor driver I always need a power supply and I'm usually going to attach a few sensors and things to it LEDs are pretty common so it just gives me everything already pre-wired and makes the experimenting a lot faster so you might even want to consider building something like this yourself but at any rate we're going to use this today for our experiments with the ESP32 and the PS3 controller now for our first experiment we're going to be controlling three LEDs and we're going to control all of them in a different fashion we're going to be using the buttons on the right side of the controller and LED1 will be controlled by the cross button. It is a momentary LED, so when you press the cross button, the LED will come on. When you release it, the LED will go off. LED number two will be controlled by the triangle button, and this is a toggle. When you press the triangle button the first time, the LED will come on. When you press it again, the LED will go off, and you can toggle the LED on and off as much as you wish. The third LED will be controlled by both the square and the circle button. Pressing the square button will turn the LED on, and pressing the circle will turn it off. Now, of course, I'm using LEDs in this example, but you could use any device that could be activated by a 3.3 volt logic signal, such as a relay or a solid state relay, to control something else. In addition to the three LEDs, we will, of course, require an ESP32, and you could use pretty well any ESP32 module. We'll also need some dropping resistors for the LEDs, and I'm using 220 ohm resistors, but any value from about 100 ohms to 470 ohms would work fine. We'll connect GPIO pin 4 of the ESP32 through one of the dropping resistors to the anode of LED1. GPIO pin 16 will also go through a dropping resistor, and this will go to the anode of LED2. And GPIO pin 15 will connect through its dropping resistor to the anode of LED3. Finally, we will connect all of the cathodes of the LEDs to one of the ESP32 ground connections. And this completes our wiring. Now let's go take a look at some code we can use to control the three LEDs with our PS3 controller. And here's a sketch that we're going to be using to control the three LEDs with the PS3 controller. And the sketch is actually pretty simple and it follows a standard format which you've already seen with the demo sketch and you're going to see with the sketches coming up as well. We start off by always including the PS3 controller library, of course, and then we're going to define some pins. These are the pins that the LEDs are connected to. We also define a couple of variables. These are state variables and they're boot and if they're false the LED is off and if they're true the LED is on so we've got one of these for each of the LEDs now the callback is actually the meat and potatoes of this but we'll get back to that in a moment we'll just zip down over here the on connect function just simply prints connected when it sees a connection from the controller and then we go into setup and the setup starts off the same for all of our sketches we'll start the serial monitor and then we define the callback function 
which is the notify function. We define the on connection function, which is the on connect function we just saw. And then we emulate the console's MAC address. And this is where you will probably have to change the address unless you're using the broadcast address as I am. So this will be the address that is stored in your PS3 controller. Then in this case, all we do is we set the LED pins as being outputs by using a pin mode command and we print out the serial monitor that we're ready. The loop is the same for all of our sketches. We basically don't do anything in the loop except monitor to see if the PS3 is actually connected. So let's go back up to the notify, which is the callback function. So this is called every time that we get some data from the controller. And uh, we're going to control the three LEDs, and we're going to control them in three different ways. The first LED is this momentary. When we press the cross button, LED 1 should come on. When we release it, the LED will go off. So we have an event for the cross button going down for when it's being pressed. We'll print to the serial monitor that it's being pressed. We'll set LED 1 state to being true, and then we'll do a digital write to LED 1 with that state, and that'll turn the LED on. Now when the button is released, we're going to get this event over here, the button up cross, and we're going to print the serial monitor that the cross button has been released. We'll set the LED 1 state false this time, right to the LED, which of course will turn it off. Now the second button is the triangle button, and this is going to toggle the LED. It's going to toggle LED 2. The first time we press it, the LED will come on and it'll stay on. The next time we press it, it'll go off. And so again, we're looking for the event of the press down on the triangle button, and we'll print that out to the serial monitor. And we take the LED2 state, which is the state that monitors this specific LED, and we'll invert it. So if the state is false, we're going to set it to true. If the state is true, we're going to set it to false. And then we just write that to the pin. And so every time we press the button, we're going to invert the state and write the state accordingly to the LED. And so that'll keep it either on or off, as the case may be. Now, the third LED, LED3, is controlled by two buttons, the square and the circle button. The square will turn it on and the circle will turn it off. So you can see the event button for pressing down on the square button. Uh, we print to the serial monitor, set LED3 state to true, and then we write to the pin. So this is the one that will turn it on. Now, the circle button will do the opposite. When it's detected, we'll set LED3 state to false and then write to the pin and turn it off. So it's a very very simple sketch, and as I said, it follows the same format that we're going to follow for all the subsequent sketches as well. So let's load it up and take a look at it in action. So we're all set up to test our LEDs, and I'm using two of the LEDs that were already on my experimenter base, plus I added a third one. So the yellow one over here is LED number one. This is the one that's going to be momentary. LED number two, the one we're going to toggle, is the red one that I've added over here. And the green one that was part of my experimenter base is LED number three, the one that we can turn on and off with the separate switches. So let's try the toggle first. Uh, that's this over here, and as we press it, I think you can see that the yellow LED at the top is turning on and off in response, and also you'll see on my serial monitor I'm getting the event. Now let's go to the toggle, which is this button over here, and when I press it and release it, the red LED is on. I'll press it and release it, and it's off, and so it does seem to work. It does indeed toggle. And the third one is the green one at the bottom over here. And uh, when I press the uh, square button, the green LED comes on. Pressing the circle button turns it off. And so that seems to work. Now, of course, once again, this is just using LEDs, but basically anything that you could control with a digital IPO port on an ESP32, you could control with the buttons on your PS3 controller. 
Now the next device that we're going to control with our PS3 controller is an RGB LED. And to control the LED, we're going to be using the four buttons on the front of the controller, the two trigger buttons and the two shoulder buttons. Now these buttons can not only just be pressed, you can also get a value from these buttons. So by pressing them more or less, you can alter that value, and we're going to use that to change the brightness of the segments of our RGB LED. We're going to use the left shoulder button to control the red segment of the LED. The left trigger button will control the green segment. The right shoulder button will control the blue segment of the RGB LED. And when we press the right trigger button, all three segments will light at full power, giving us a white output. So for our experiment, we will need, of course, an RGB LED, and I'm using a common cathode RGB LED. Of course, we'll require an ESP32, and we'll need dropping resistors for each of the LED segments. Again, I'm using three 220 ohm resistors, but any values from 100 to about 470 ohms would work fine. We'll connect GPIO pin 25 of the ESP32 through its dropping resistor to the red segment of the LED. GPIO pin 26 will go through a dropping resistor to the green segment, and GPIO pin 27 will go through its dropping resistor to the blue segment of the RGB LED. Finally, we'll connect the common cathode connection to one of the ground connections on the ESP32. And this completes our wiring. Now let's go and see how we can control the brightness of the segments of an RGB LED using a PS3 controller. Now here's the sketch that we're going to be using to control our RGB LED. And unlike the previous LED sketch, we're going to be controlling the brightness of the individual segments in the LED. So we'll be using pulse width modulation for that. We are not going to be using analog write, however. The ESP32 has a built-in function for controlling LEDs, and it has a number of channels you can assign for the LED control, and we're going to be using those. So we're going to start off by including including our PS3 controller library. And then we're going to define the connections to the three segments within our LED, the red, green, and blue. And we're going to define some pulse width modulation properties. Now the first thing we're defining here is the frequency, and we're setting it up to 5 kilohertz. And the next thing we define is the resolution, and we're setting this to 8 bits, and that means a number from 0 to 255 will be required for our PWM. Now we need to define some channels to assign to the LED control, and the ESP32 has a number of them. We're just going to take the first three, so we'll assign red to channel 0, green to channel 1, and blue to channel 2. And we'll also create a few variables, and these will hold the values of the LED's PWM, so they'll go from 0 to 255, and 0 is off, and that's what we'll initialize them at. Now, once again, the callback function is the meat and potatoes of this sketch, and we'll ignore it at the moment and move on. The onConnect function is exactly the same as it was in the previous sketch. In fact, in all of the sketches, they're the same. The setup, we start off the same way by initializing the serial monitor, attaching the uh, callback to the notify function, attaching the onConnect to the onConnect function, and over here putting in the MAC address that our controller is holding, and you may need to change that for your controller. Now here's where we get to the LEDs. We use the LEDC setup for each of the channels, and we're defining the channel, the frequency, and the resolution for all three three of those channels. So we set up three different channels, and then we attach the LED pins to those corresponding channels. So we'll attach the red uh, channel to the red pin, the green channel to the green pin, and the blue to the blue pin. And then we print the serial monitor that we're ready. And once again, our loop is the same loop that we used before. Now let's go back up and look at the notify callback function to see what we're actually doing. And we're looking for the event of the buttons having changed. Now remember, we're using the four buttons at the front. And when you press them, you'll get both an analog value and an event that it 
indicates they've changed. So if the red one has changed, we're going to take the analog value and assign it to the PWM value. And it's great because the analog value we're going to get is going to be from 0 to 255, and that's exactly what we need for PWM. And so we do that uh, for the green and the blue buttons as well. Now for the other button where we want everything to be white, we're going to detect the change, and at that point we're just going to set red, green, and blue to 255 and if you turn them all to 255 the LED will glow white or a good approximation of white. Then at the end of this we'll write all the values to the LED channels which we'll write them to the LED and then we'll just print them out to the serial monitor, have a short delay and do everything over again. So it's a pretty simple sketch again and so let's load it up and watch it work. Okay, so let's see how we can control our RGB LED. I'll press the button over here and we're getting red and I know it's a little hard to see in the monitor but it's a pretty nice red now as I release on the button you can see on the serial monitor I can get some lower values it's a little difficult I'm not really that good at this but as I do the red does dim although it's a little hard to see that I realize on the video now the green one over here <clears throat> is the same effect And here's the blue one down over here. And as you can see, by pressing on the trigger and sort of releasing it, I can change levels. And of course, I can start blending the colors as well, too. And if I want everything on, I can just hit white over here. Although white does actually look a lot like blue. But there you go, we can get the R, G, and B values from our three different buttons and use them to control an RGB LED with our PS3 controller. The next device that we're going to be controlling with our PlayStation 3 controller is a servo motor. And we're going to be using the left joystick to control the motor. Now we don't want the motor to track the joystick position, of course, because when we let go of the joystick, it'll just go back to the center position. Instead, we're going to use the joystick to move the motor in one direction or another. If we push the joystick to the left, it'll drive the servo motor to the left. Pushing it to the right will drive the servo to the right, and you can use these movements to position the servo exactly where you want it. If you push the joystick up, it'll move the servo to its home or 90 degree position. Now in addition to the servo motor, we will need two things. One of them, of course, is the ESP32, and the other thing is a power supply for the servo motor. The servo power supply needs to be from 5 to 6 volts, and because the servo motors work best at 6 volts, a great power supply can consist of a battery pack with either 4 AA or 4 AAA batteries. The connection to the ESP32 is very simple. We'll take the control line of the servo motor and connect it to ESP32 pin GPIO13. The VCC line for the servo motor will go to the positive end of the servo power supply. And the ground connection of the servo will be connected to both the ground of the power supply and the ground of the ESP32. Make certain that these two grounds are connected together. And this completes our wiring. Now let's go take a look at the code that we'll use to make this work. Now here's the sketch that we're going to use to control the servo motor with our PS3 controller. We're going to start off with two libraries this time, the same PS3 controller library that we've been using in our other sketches, as well as the ESP32 servo library, which of course we're going to use for the servo motor. We're going to define an object to represent that servo motor, SRVMTR, and we're going to define a couple of integers that represent the value of the left joystick on the controller so the left x and the left y axis value. This integer defines the position of the servo motor and it's in degrees so it'll be from 0 to 180. We're going to initialize it as 90 which is the center of its travel and then we define which pin we're going to be using to connect the servo and that's GPIO 13. Once again we're going to zip by the callback function and we're going to take a look at everything else on connect is the same. Setup starts exactly 
exactly the same as it did before. Remember to alter the MAC address if you need to over here. On After that, we're going to attach our servo to the servo pin. Then we're going to write to it to home it to 90 degrees. Remember, servo pause is initiated with a value of 90. And then we're going to write to the serial monitor to say that we're ready. The loop is the same as we saw before. So now we'll go and take a look at the callback. The first thing we do in the callback is we get the values of the X and the Y joystick and we assign them to the two different variables. Now these values are going to go from negative 128 to positive 127 and they're negative or positive depending on which direction you press the stick. In the center the value is a zero. Now we're going to take a look first to see if we've moved the joystick up because that is indicating that we want the home to servo at 90 degrees. So we take a look at the left one and it's going to go negative. It'll be higher negative. It'll be negative 128 when we get to the very top. So if it's at least negative 100 or less, then we know we've moved that stick. We'll set the servo position to 90. We'll write that to the servo and put a slight delay in. Otherwise, we're going to check to see if it moved left or right. So we're going to take a look at the X axis right now and we're going to see if the x-axis is less than negative 10 and the reason we're picking the 10 is we want a little bit of a gap around the center because these joysticks aren't perfect and we're also going to make sure the servo position is less than 180 because if we've gone beyond 180 degrees we don't want to increment it anymore assuming those conditions are satisfied we're going to increment the servo position one write that to the servo motor and delay because remember moving it left or right just increments the servo. It moves it. It's not an absolute position. We do the opposite thing if it's moved in the opposite direction. We'll decrement the servo position and then we'll write that to the servo. Then finally we'll print all of our values to the serial monitor. And so here's our sketch. Let's go and load it up and see if we can control our servo motor with our PS3 controller. And so we're ready to control our servo motor. Here's a servo here, and this is the 90 degree position for it. And so if I move my joystick over, you can see I can move the servo all the way to one end. If I move it this way and hold it, it will go to the other end. So I can move the servo back and forth and just increment its position. Just by moving the joystick, you can see on the serial monitor the values I'm getting. And if I move the joystick up, it heads right for the 90 degree mark. And of course, I haven't defined anything for moving the joystick down. You could define another position as you want. And that movement up doesn't have to be 90 degrees. It can be any position that you want to home your servo into. And so this is a really cool way of controlling a servo motor remotely using a PS3 controller and an ESP32. Now for our next experiment, we're going to be using a TOF sensor, which is a time of flight sensor or a distance sensor. This is comparable to something like an HCSR04 ultrasonic sensor, except it uses laser light and it is far faster. I've covered this sensor before in a previous episode of the DroneBot Workshop. Now in this experiment, we're not going to be activating the sensor. Instead, we're going to have the sensor activate the controller. It will measure the distance to the nearest object. Now within our code, we are going to set a threshold distance. And if the distance we receive is less than the threshold distance, then we're going to activate the motors inside the controller to make it vibrate. So this is going to be a vibrating sensor that will vibrate when we get too close to something. Now, in addition to the TOF10120 sensor, we will, of course, need an ESP32. The TOF sensor is an I2C device, and so it connects to the ESP32 I2C connections, and there are several you can use. I use GPIO pin 33, which is the SCL line for the TOF10120. GPIO pin 32 is the data or SDA line for the TOF sensor. The VCC connection on the TOF sensor will be connected to the ESP32's 3.3 volt output. And of course we'll need to connect the ground of the TOF10120 to one of the ESP32 grounds. 
And that completes our wiring. Now let's go and take a look at some code we can use with the TOF10120 sensor. Now here's the sketch that we're going to use with the time of flight sensor. And a lot of the elements of this sketch were based upon an earlier sketch that I showed you for using the TOF sensor in the episode that I had dedicated to it. So if you want a bit more information about this sensor, I invite you to take a look at that video. Now we're going to start off by including the required libraries. In this case, it's both the PS3 controller library and the wire library because we are using I squared C for the sensor. Now the pins for the I2C or I squared C bus that we are using, the SDA and SCL pins, we're defining them over here because on the ESP32 you have multiple I squared C connections and you need to define which ones that you're using. Now these variables have to do with the time of flight sensor and again I'm not going to go through these in detail because I did that in the previous video. This is a variable we're using that's important to our code, the TOF distance. This is is the actual distance in millimeters that we are reading from the time of flight sensor. And this is a min disk. This is the threshold that we're defining. And you can change this number to anything you like. This is the distance in millimeters. And if the distance is less than this, this is when we are going to trigger the vibrating motors in our controller to make it rumble. So again, you could change that. Remember the value is in millimeters. Now, interestingly enough, the callback function function has nothing in it today and there's a reason for that because in this case we are not receiving data from the controller we are sending data to the controller so we don't need a callback function because we're not receiving anything the on connect function is the same as we've always used now this is one of the two actually one of the three functions that I've taken from the previous sketches that I used for the TOF sensor so I won't go through them in any detail the sensor TOF read which actually does a bunch of bit banging on the I squared C line to get the values out of everything. This is read TOF distance and this will actually receive the distance from that so it extracts the distance and calculates it and this is just something that formats the data. Now we'll go into setup. Setup starts off the same way. We do the same attach for the callback and the on connection although of course the callback isn't going to be used here and once again you'll need to set your MAC address accordingly. Now we need to start off the wire library for I2C and we're going to do that with a wire begin and point to the two different pins and then we'll print to our serial monitor. Now in our sketch today we are actually going to be using the loop to do everything which is different than the other sketches that we've seen before but we're going to go and read the distance by doing a TOF distance equals the read TOF distance and so this will bring back the distance in millimeters. We're going to print that out to the serial monitor. We're going to look to make sure that we're connected to the PS3 controller and if we are we're going to compare that distance to the minimum distance and if it is below the minimum distance then we're going to set the rumble on on the controller which should vibrate the motors if however it is above that distance then we'll turn the rumble off we'll do a half second delay and do it all over again so again if you want to understand the functions for the tof sensor a bit further you can see my previous video but otherwise it's a fairly simple sketch let's load it up and see if we can get our controller rumbling when we get too close to the tof sensor now here's my setup. I've got the TOF sensor actually mounted on the front of the servo motor and you can see my controller over here. And if I come near the sensor, I'm hoping you can hear and see that the controller is moving all over the place. If I move my hand, it stops. And so basically we are detecting when we're getting too close to something and when we are, we vibrate the controller. And uh, when we're far enough away, the controller stops vibrating. And of course, you can set the threshold to someplace different if you don't want to set it for the same distance I did. And so this is a way that you can provide tactical feedback using both a PS3 controller and an ESP32. <laughs> Now the final ESP32 peripheral that we're going to control with the Sony PlayStation 3 controller is a DC motor driver, specifically the TB6612FNG motor driver. 
we're going to be using the motor driver to drive two DC motors, which of course is very convenient for me because I already have this all wired up on my robot car experimenters base. I'm going to control both of the DC motors using the right joystick and we'll do it in the standard fashion that we've used before when controlling DC motors with a joystick. Pushing it forward will move both of the motors in a forward direction. Pulling it backwards will move them in a reverse direction and going side to side will vary the speed between the two motors, allowing us to steer the car. Now in addition to the TB6612FNG motor driver, which can also be an L298N motor driver if you wish, we'll also require of course our ESP32 and the power supply for the DC motors. The power supply will of course depend upon your motor voltage and once again you should not share power supplies between the ESP32 and the motor. We're going to connect all four motor output connections, that's A01, A02, B02, and B01, to connectors that will go to our external motors, which I'm not showing in the diagram. We'll also connect the positive side of the motor power supply to the VM lead on the motor driver, and we'll connect the negative side of the motor power supply to a ground pin on our motor driver. The VCC on the motor driver is connected to the 3.3 volt output of the ESP32. Now you could also use the 5 volt output if you wish, but as we're using 3.3 volt logic, this will work fine. That VCC voltage will also be connected to the standby pin on the motor driver. This permanently enables the motor driver so that we can use it. Now we'll connect the inputs of the motor driver. The PWMA, which is the PWM signal for channel A, is connected to GPIO pin 22. The AN2 connection goes to GPIO pin 5. AN1 goes to GPIO pin 18. BN1 goes to GPIO pin 19. BN2 to GPIO pin 21. And the PWMB connection will go to GPIO pin 23. Finally, we'll connect the ground from the ESP32 to one of the ground connections on the TB6612FNG motor driver. And this completes our wiring. Now let's go and take a look at some code we can use to move our motors using the PS3 controller and the ESP32. Now here's a sketch that we're going to be using to control our two motors with the PS3 controller. And we're going to start off, of course, with the PS3 controller library as we have with the other sketches. Next, we define the pins that we're using to connect to the motor drivers. And these are these over here. And now we're going to define the PWM parameters. We're doing the same thing we did with the RGB LED. And we're using the registers for PWM within the ESP32. Now, some of you may point out that the ESP32 actually has two PWM registers that are specifically made for controlling motors. However, they're rather difficult to use with the Arduino IDE, so I elected just to use the LED ones, and they'll work fine with motors as well. We set the frequency of the PWM. In this case, we're going to use 1000, which is 1 kilohertz, and we'll also set the resolution to 8 bits. Then we need to define two of the PWM channels, and I've defined channels 3 and 4 as motor channel A and motor B channel. Then we have some variables, and these will represent the actual PWM values. Since we're using an 8-bit PWM, these will range from 0 to 255, and they are basically the speed of each of the motors. We initialize them with values of 0, so the motors initialize being stopped. We also have a Boolean that we define for the motor direction with true equaling forward and false equaling reverse. Now there's only one Boolean because in this particular design, both of the motors will always be spinning in the same direction. We also have a couple of variables over here that we define, and this is the X and Y axis from the right joystick, and these are the values that we are going to be receiving from the controller, and they go both positive and negative depending on which way you have the joystick pushed. Now once again, we'll come back to the callback function at the end because it's really the heart of the sketch. Uh, we'll go down and see that the on connection function is the same as always, and that we have another 
another function we've defined for this sketch, and it's called the motor movement function, move motors. And the inputs to it are the motor A speed, the motor B speed, and the motor direction. And so first we look at the motor direction. If it's supposed to be reversed, then we go and we set all of the pins accordingly to the motor driver. Otherwise forward, we set the pins uh, in the opposite. And then we'll go and actually drive the motors with an LEDC right, a motor A channel to motor A speed, a motor B channel to motor B speed. Okay, now let's go into the setup. The setup starts the same as it always has. The serial monitor uh, will attach the callback function, which once again we've called notify and the on connect function. And then the MAC address for the console, actually um, the MAC address needs to be changed naturally for whatever you are using and you're probably pretty familiar with this by now. Okay, uh, we set the uh, pin mode, the out to output for all of our motor controller pins. Then we'll set the LED channel parameters up for each of the motors. So we'll give it the channel, the frequency, and the resolution. And then we'll attach those to the specific PWM pins for both of the motors. And then we print ready on our serial monitor and we're done. The loop once again is basically nothing. And so we'll go back up to the callback function, the notify function. And uh, there we go. A notify, first of all, we'll get the values for the right joystick for both the X and Y axis. Remember, these can be both positive or negative, depending on which direction the joystick has been pressed. And we'll use the Y axis position to determine whether we are going forward or backwards. If it's a negative number, we want to go forward. If it is a positive number, we will go backwards. And then we'll convert the joystick values to a positive value of 0 to 255 because we're going to get values from negative 127 to positive 128 over here. So what we do is we do an absolute on the value. So absolute takes away the negative sign if it is a negative, uh, whether it's a negative or positive number, it always returns a positive one. And then we're just going to multiply it by 2. Now we could have used a map command here, of course, that would have also worked. But in this case, since our range is exactly half of where we want to go, I just did a multiplication. Now we need to factor in the x-axis because the x-axis will determine whether we are going to run the motors at the same speed or whether one motor is going to go faster than the other. And so we take a look at the position of the x-axis. If um, if it, and we use a value of 10 and negative 10 because we want a little range in the middle just to account for some variations in the joystick. And in this case, motor B is faster than motor A, so motor A has the X subtracted from its speed, and motor B has the X added to the speed. Otherwise, it's the opposite condition over here. And if none of these conditions are satisfied, then the controller is actually in the middle, and both motors will be going the same speed, so they'll both just do speed Y, and X won't get factored in. Now, with all the math we've just done, it's entirely possible that we've created the value above 255 or below zero. So we're going to use the very handy constrain function to constrain our values between zero and 255. And then we're going to actually drive the motors. We'll call the move motors function that I just illustrated earlier. And we will print our values out to the serial monitor. And so that's the sketch. Let's load it up and see if we can get our motors moving and controlled. Okay, I've got everything hooked up right now in my robot car base. I'm hooked up through my own motor driver to the uh, two motors over here. And of course, I'm powering everything with the power supply I've got built in. Got the controller here. You can see I've got a bunch of zeros right now on the screen. But when I move, I'm hoping you can see with the dots on the wheels that it's moving. If I pull it back, it moves the other direction. If I go off of only to one side, I can get this one moving. This side gets this one moving. And if I do it at an angle, I'll get them both moving, but as you can see at different speeds. And of course, if the car was let loose off of its base, it would probably be moving all around the room right now. And so that seems to work pretty good. And this is probably a great application for a PS3 controller driving a little robot car. And as you can see, it's pretty easy to do.
And so here's the final sketch, and basically this is just an amalgamation of all of the previous sketches. So there's certainly no need to go through all of the code. It combines everything that we have seen so far. Now there is one change, however, that I wanted you to note, and it's something I had to do to get this to work. And it's for the RGB LED channels that we've defined. You may recall that in the original sketch, I defined the red channel as channel 0, the green channel is 1, and the blue channel is channel 2. And that worked fine when we tested the RGB LED by itself. However, when I combined this with the servo motor sketch, I ran into a problem. Every time that I tried to move the servo motor, first of all, the servo would move erratically, not as nicely as it did when we just had the servo by itself. And secondly, the red part of the RGB LED would glow slightly every time I did that. Also, if I turned on the red part of the LED using the controller, the servo would start to move erratically. So it seemed to me that the two of them were interfering with each other. And so what I did to resolve that was I changed the red to another channel, and I used channel 5 because, remember, channels 3 and 4 are being used by the motor. And once I did that, everything was fine, and I can just assume that channel 0 is also being used by the ESP32 servo motor library, and it probably has a conflict. But other than that change, this is exactly all the code that we used before. It's everything, all the serial prints and all that for all of the different peripherals that we are uh, controlling with the controller. And uh, if you want to get this code, the easiest way to do that, of course, is just head over to the DroneBotWorkshop.com website and download it from the article that accompanies this video. So let's upload this and see our final results. Okay, so I've got the sketch loaded up right now, and it pretty well just does everything the old sketch used to do. So we can start trying our LEDs, for example. Here's the toggle, and here's the momentary, here's the on and off, and we can move our servo motor, get it to 90 degrees, that works. And of course, moving these motors work. and the LED, and we can make it go different colors. And do them all at about the same time. We can do things simultaneously. And there we go, we can basically control everything with the PS3 controller. Now, of course, if you're building a robot car, naturally some of these things like the LEDs and that aren't going to be that much use for you. But as you've seen between the code examples I've given you and the sample code that came with the library, you can pretty well control anything with one of these amazing little devices. Okay, that about wraps it up for today's video. I hope that you enjoyed it, and I really hope it's opened your eyes up to the fact that you can use a PS3 game controller for a lot more than just video games. In fact, with an ESP32, you can just about control anything with it. Now, if you want to get a bit more information about what we did today, you can check out the article that accompanies this video on the DroneBotWorkshop.com website, and you'll find a link to that article right below the video and the article has got more information and the code that I use today as well. Now, if uh, you'd like to discuss this a bit further, a good place to do that is on the DroneBot Workshop forums at forum.dronebotworkshop.com. You'll find a lot of like-minded individuals there who love to discuss electronics and who would be happy to help you out with any problem that you're having on your project. And hey, you might be able to help them out with something as well. And of course, it's free to sign up for the forum. If you'd like to keep in touch with me, I have a newsletter. You'll find a sign-up on both the forum and the website website for that and it's a free newsletter I just send out every now and then and of course if you haven't please subscribe to the YouTube channel I love getting new subscribers and I'd love to have you be the next one and all you need to do is hit that little red subscribe button down below the video and also click on the bell notification and assuming that you have had notifications enabled on your website
web browser, you will get notified every time that I make a new video. So until the next time we meet, please take care of yourself. Please stay safe out there. And I will see you again very soon here in the DroneBot Workshop. Goodbye for now.